I wanted to start out by having you imagine what it might look like to be in Boston Common in the late 1700s. If you stood looking west out toward Cambridge, you would see a very different scene than you see today. Salt marshes, mud flats, um, you'd be standing amongst cows. Um, but even at that point, there had been significant changes to the estuary, major changes <clears throat> to the water resources. You'll see there's a mill pond at the north end, on, in, actually in North Cove is what it's called, um, in, uh, in Boston. And Boston is essentially an island. The uh, blue line is uh, what is modern day Washington Street. <clears throat> so this image, is, there are a lot of these images that are out there about Boston, um, but what essentially this is, is pretty neat. Um, taking the current outline of Boston, which is a thin white line, and then superimposing over it the outline around the time of when uh, Paul Revere and uh, Dawes did their ride. Um, and this is what it looks like when you fill it in. Pretty profound, right? Big changes. So I'm not here to give a history lesson about Boston. This is a talk about water. But I wanted to give a little bit of context, some historical context, for what essentially is my key question. Given the significant and monumental changes that we've made to our urban environments, what can we do now to mitigate this, those impacts? Um, this is actually a picture from one of my family vacations. Um, very exciting things interspersed between uh, pictures of the kids on the beach or a sunset. Uh, we get things like this. Um, and uh, they're, they're far more than, uh, than maybe the family is happy with. <laughs> um, so what is this? This is a combined sewer overflow. Um, I'm going to give you a little background until we dive into um, the uh, solutions, which are really the exciting part of the talk. But you have to understand the problem first. Um, so combined sewer overflows, essentially what we've done is in many places constructed, and I'll give some more detail on this, um, around, around the world and in the United States are sewer systems, so they both handle flows from stormwater and from wastewater at the same time. And the result is this. So how many of you um, maybe were aware that around the world we discharged raw sewer into our waterways? Probably most of you, right? I mean, I think we have an intuitive sense that there are bad things happening. How many of you know that this is happening on a regular basis in the United States? A lot of people are very surprised to hear that. Um, you know, it's 2013 and we're still discharging raw sewage, a major issue. This is an example from a city in the Northeast, and uh, I won't name it here, but um, this is what one of these things looks like. When you have a large storm event, you essentially end up with wastewater mixing with, uh, with surface waters. And uh, it, looks, it looks, even if you knew about these things, it's pretty shocking when you see it. Um, it's an affront to the senses, and frankly, it feels like an affront to uh, the very core. So this is the number of cities that actually have this <coughs> issue currently in the United States. 772 cities have combined sewer overflows as of today. That's an EPA number. And over the next 20 years, we're expected to spend $100 billion dollars complying with the Clean Water Act, which isn't even, from my perspective, a solution that gets us to where we need to be. But this is a significant burden on, uh, on ratepayers in particular, locals who bear the brunt of the, uh, of the cost of mitigating these problems. So I described this a little bit, but I wanted to give you one graphic that basically shows you what this really looks like. So on the, uh, on the uh, right hand side, um, for me, on the left for you, is during dry weather. A combined sewer functions quite well during dry weather. It actually takes the storm sewer, um, the uh, sewage from homes and industry, and takes it off to the wastewater treatment plant. Everything's going just fine. The problem is, in these 772 cities, when it rains, that rainwater enters into the same sewer, and the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant and of the sewer is inadequate to address these flows. So what happens? The combined flows um, discharge directly into the river. So there are conventional civil engineering solutions. So I'm a civil engineer. This is how we solve problems. We dig really big holes. Um, this is uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, this is only part of their solution, uh, actually. And they're not unique. And Portland is really at the forefront of addressing these issues. So I certainly don't want to single them out. They spent nearly a half a billion dollars just building this east side tunnel. It's a 25 foot diameter, nearly six mile long tunnel under the city of Portland. Something that when you go there, you don't even realize is there. And it's very specifically targeted at this combined sewer issue. It's the only function. So we took a half a billion dollars, essentially dug a hole in the ground, and the only thing it does is address this deficiency to the sewer. But there's another way to address these issues, and actually Portland is a leader in this. 
um, we have, over the last 10 years, started to work on new types of solutions. And broadly, these are called green infrastructure. And I'll give you some ideas about what those look like. Essentially, conceptually, it's a very good idea. Instead of spending money on these large underground facilities that have no other value, let's spend the money to fundamentally change the urban environment in ways that are beneficial to us and that are visible and that change our, our uh, lifestyles as well as the core of our cities. So what do these things look like? Um, this is a constructed wetland, and it's actually in Massachusetts that we designed about 10 years ago. Um, this is a daylighting of a system. One thing you can do with combined sewers is, is to uh, separate the uh, two different types of flow so that you get the, uh, the surface flows going into the receiving water separate from the storm sewer. So that's actually that Boston has done a very good job of this, separating sewers. But in the process, you can also incorporate green features, which um, significantly enhance the water quality of what ends up in the receiving water. And then at a very micro scale, this is actually at uh, Plymouth Town Hall, and you can go see this thing. Um, you can get to, from very big, things like constructed wetlands, all the way down to planters on the sides of building where, where you're disconnecting roof leaders, routing them into natural treatment systems, using those processes to clean up the water and to separate the flows from the combined sewer. And then lastly, I wanted to show for green infrastructure um, a uh, pilot project that we did in New York City. Not all of these green infrastructure components actually look green, and there's actually a great debate in our industry about whether or not those should even be categorized as green infrastructure. But this is what's called a, gr a blue roof. So essentially what we did was we placed trays on top of a roof to slow down the water so that it doesn't go into the combined sewer as a, at such a quick rate. Timing is everything in these systems. If you get the timing right, this is a key point for what I'm gonna say next, if you get the timing right and you can control the volume, you can mitigate these issues. Because the primary reason that the flows occur is because the water comes at the wrong time. So there's more we can do here. I could actually give a really interesting talk just on green infrastructure, but that wouldn't necessarily be as exciting as what we're really doing. Um, so all the examples I'm going to show you after this are doing something that no one else has done in the industry, and we've actually heard a lot about. Um, we hear a lot about things like, with the power grid, um, smart infrastructure. Um, I think even in some of the presidential speeches, we hear about the smart grid, right? Well, with water, there is a similar analogy. And the examples I'm going to give use some components um, that we've actually heard a lot about uh, at different TED conferences um, in order to change the way information interacts with infrastructure. So every one of the examples I'll show actually use the Internet of Things. And you may have heard that term. If you haven't, what it essentially is, is the integration of information um, with the physical world. So it's physical computing. It's taking the virtual internet and extending it to real things, which means we start controlling and monitoring real things in the same way we interact with pieces of virtual information. So what does this really mean? How do you combine those two things for civil infrastructure? So here's an example. Um, we build things. One green infrastructure strategy is a rainwater harvesting system. You take water from the roof, you store it in a tank, um, and that tank then um, can provide water for things like toilet flushing or irrigation. Um, it can also provide a detention component to mitigate these downstream impacts like draining into a combined sewer. The problem is there's no reliability around the demand for the water in the tank. So the tank doesn't function well from a design perspective. But we can do one thing, and actually it's a, it's a very small thing. You'll see there's a small valve in the bottom right-hand part of this picture. And it looks a lot like this valve right here. It's about the smallest thing you can build in civil infrastructure. Most of the things I can't bring into the auditorium. So this is a valve that we constructed. Um, and it can be, we actually have installed them exactly on systems like this, and I'll show some others as well. And uh, let me hold this still. And essentially, it's pretty simple. It's just a slide gate. So that's, that's one component. The other thing you need for what we call this an advanced rainwater harvesting systems is a sensor. This is a simple pressure transducer. It will tell you the level in the tank. And then the really important piece, it must be really big, right? So it's not. This is the really important piece. So what this is, is a Wi-Fi connected internet gateway for the internet of things. So essentially, if you take this sensor and this valve, and you take an existing rainwater harvesting system, and you hook it up to this little tiny device. This costs $50. It's from a company out in Marlboro called IO Bridge. 
Um, and you connect these items up to the cloud, you can do amazing things. So integrating information um, fundamentally changes the way in which these structures work. Um, so you're gonna ask, how does it change them? Why is that interesting? So the really key thing, the key thing for reliably using this investment in infrastructure, whether it's a deep tunnel, whether it's a rainwater harvesting system, is whether or not the storage is available when you need it. Seems pretty simple. So what piece of information could we use in order to ensure reliability around that storage? Weather forecasts. So very simply, and this is probably the most simple example I could give, but taking a piece of information, a weather forecast, and integrating it into the function of a civil engineering infrastructure completely changes the performance. And I'll give you some other examples. They all look like this. Um, this is a rainwater harvesting system in, at Twin Oaks Library in Austin, Texas. Um, we have, they actually had an existing system when we retrofit it to perform using forecast information. And actually this is something, uh, just as an aside, this is called a remote reality interface. So when, when our, um, uh, when the people at the library or the city looks at the dashboard about what's going on with this system, they actually get a real image, a 3D rendering with a hole cut out of the side of the tank that shows you the actual level in the tank at that time. You don't need to be a scientist, you need, don't need to interpret any graphs. My four-year-old could tell you whether the tank is empty or not, right? Um, so uh, in, in addition to doing really neat things, we're also able to leverage all of the really great infrastructure that comes along with cloud-based Internet of Things. So we've done the same thing. You can do not just rainwater harvesting systems. This is a porous pavement parking lot in Omaha, Nebraska. We took this exact valve and we put it after the fact on the underdrain system. So what this is is a porous pavement surface with a storage layer of stone. And then there was an underdrain system. That underdrain system connects to the combined sewer. So this was built a few years ago and we were able to go back and retrofit this system so that we can control the flow. Dramatically changes its performance and we can use forecast information. We can actually run experiments, even experiments where the system learns its own behavior by just hooking this uh, basic piece of civil infrastructure up to the cloud. Uh, SAP headquarters outside Philadelphia, the uh, big database company, their turf grass, beautiful lead platinum building, their turf grass green roof, their um, mechanical float switch for the flood irrigated layer on the green roof broke. We went in and retrofit it. We took the solenoid and the level sensor. We hooked it up to the cloud exactly in the same way that I've described with very lightweight infrastructure. And now the roof itself can make intelligent decisions based on the forecast about whether or not to irrigate whether or not to allow evapotranspiration of the turf grass green roof to recover storage, and what do we get out the other end? Stormwater control. We make um, this storage available just as a result of in integrating information. Uh, in St. Louis, we have seven systems of public housing projects. This one's really interesting. I just wanted to show that there are different form factors in particular. Again, or this is a rainwater harvesting system. Uh, Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, this doesn't, doesn't just have to be stuff that's buried. Brooklyn Botanical Gardens is going to use their water features, they're actually constructing it right now, um, with the exact technologies I've described. If it's highly probable, this is in a combined sewer area, if it's highly probable that it's going to rain, the beautiful Japanese garden allows its water feature to be depleted during dry weather so that we get complete capture of the wet weather runoff during um, the following wet weather. And then I wanted to show a really profound example. Um, this was one of the most serious disasters, Superstorm Sandy, um, that our country has experienced in the past few years. And we've asked a lot of questions about infrastructure as a result of Superstorm Sandy. But I wanted to kind of meld together the, uh, the idea of resilience and disaster response with what I've been talking about. So we were lucky enough during Superstorm Sandy to have one of these rainwater harvesting systems operating in North Carolina. And this is actually taken, if, if any of you are watching CNN, when the battery flooded, I was also logged on to my computer doing screen captures of our dashboards, but it's kind of like my family vacation, right? I'm really connected to this stuff all the time. Um, what you'll see in this, uh, in this image to the top left, there's this big dip in the black line that goes down, and there's a red period um, that comes down. That was on October 26th. What happened was this tank was nearly full before that. You can see the black line is near the top. The tank was nearly full. If the system had not been watching the weather 
every drop of rain, or just about every drop of rain that fell on that rooftop would have overflowed the system and discharged uncontrolled. This system, well before any of us really thought that Sandy was going to happen, was watching the weather and making its own decisions based on algorithms we designed. It drained itself down, as you can see, as that black line dips on the 26th, and it waited. It gambled on the weather, it made a prediction. And it got great, great wet weather capture, and the, the volume wasn't large enough to completely mitigate um, what's occurring, but I think it's instructive about where we're headed. This isn't about the solutions we have now, it's about the solutions that we're headed toward. Um, so this was really exciting. I mean, this is a piece of infrastructure that on its own decided to act in our best interest. Pretty exciting stuff. So what comes next? Uh, just to wrap up, um, I really feel uh, in a field that actually changes very slowly, civil engineering, it's not exactly a hotbed of innovation. Um, although there are lots of exciting things, um, I feel we're on the cusp of a fundamental revolution of reinventing our cities. And it has to do with all the things that you guys have sitting in your pockets. It's cloud computing, it's the internet of things. When we can take this information and integrate it into our infrastructure, we can really change our cities in profound ways and go back and try to attempt to, to recreate the environments that we want to live in. Um, in conclusion, I'm very excited about this stuff. I think you guys should be too. Um, and uh, I encourage you to, um, to go out and learn more about it.